Right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to discuss a little bit about the current technology in cardiac CT and basic principles. Well, CT allow a comprehensive assessment of cardiac structure. We can look at the coronary lumen stenosis, look at the plaque. Uh, we can do functional analysis in terms of ejection fraction, CTFFR. We can look at the valve structure. And that's all thanks to the high spatial resolution, isotropic vessel resolution, high contrast resolution, fast acquisition, large anatomical coverage of the current technology CT. And this development happened uh, over the last several decades. As you can see here, over 100 years ago, when the first check accessory was obtained, it wasn't until 1960 when the first X-ray coronary angiogram was obtained. 1972, the first X-ray computer tomography uh, was uh, invented, and the structure that was imaged first was uh, the brain. But at the same time, Sir, Sir Hansfield uh, already uh, figured out and, and mentioned the potential application of imaging the heart. But obviously, the technology wasn't up to the task in imaging this highly mobile uh, structure with the heart. It wasn't until um, early 2000 or late 1990s when the first coronary CTA was used, was, uh, was attempted using the EBCT, which has a much higher uh, temporal resolution. But the real application of coronary CT wasn't possible until the helical CT and the 64 slice CT was invented. The coronary CTA, non-invasive assessment of the coronary artery disease had become a reality. As you can see, for the last 15 years, there's been an explosion of technology and now we have dual source CT, a white detector CT, a 320 size CT, able to produce a, a, a dynamic or a gated uh, 4D images of the heart. And in 2020s, I think the, the new development of the spectral photon counting CT will push even the boundary. Uh, further for the application of the cardiac CT. So we will require a multiple lecture to cover um, cardiac CT and, uh, but today I'm gonna to try to just double in some terms, uh, concepts that we use daily, uh, some uh, basic concepts some of the hardware we use, and most importantly, acquisition scanning protocol. The rest, uh, we will do it throughout the year, the fellows. Okay, so what's the limitation of the chest x-ray? That's for us is obvious because it doesn't allow us to have 3D and visualization of the anatomy. So essentially, the density at a given point in image represents the x-ray attenuation or X-ray source pass through the patient and, uh, and then pick up by the detector, the other side of the patient. And the information about the dimension parallel to the X-ray beam is lost. This also applied to fluoroscopy. And that's why um, CT was invented essentially um, to allow us to acquire a large number of transmission images through the patient at different position, and then we reconstruct it three-dimensionally. Um, so the basic principle that we have X-ray tube, 
that generate surface electrons is accelerated through a generator, pass through the patient, through a collimator first, is attenuated by the tissue of the patient, and the light and the photon that pass through is captured by the detector the other side of the patient right here and convert them into visual light and then transfer into electro signal. And through mathematical manipulation, uh, would uh, uh, produce the images that we, we are so used to see. So, so each study actually acquire a large number a transmission measurement over a thousand for each position. And that's why I uh, saw so, um, so many images that we see and, and contains a lot of data. So this is a picture, actual picture of the hardware. So this is called gantry. This is the bed where the patient goes. And inside you have the x-ray source. This is a single source. CT and the detectors in the opposite end. This is a generator. And this is the dual source CT that we have in our hospital. We have two X-ray source, uh, 90 degrees to each other. And you have two arrays of detector opposite end. And patients, so the X-ray generate uh, X X-ray photons go through the patient and is captured by the, the detector. So that's the basic principle, how the CT image is generated. So the X-ray source generate X-ray. So what is the term that we use all, often? Um, MA is called tube current. So essentially it's the amount of energy to create a certain amount of radiation. So it's what it means is how much photons was actually generated from the X-ray source. So the more photon, the higher dose, but also the better the image. And uh, MAS, which is a different concept, is a tube current time product. So it's a product of X-ray tube current in milliamperes and the exposure time per rotation in second. So obviously more exposure time, higher MAS, higher radiation. And we can modulate the amount of photon going through generated by the X-ray tube. So it's important because uh, the surface of the body is not homogeneous and you don't want to give too much radiation if the body part you want to scan is thinner. So essential or, or part of the cardiac cycle that you're, interest, you're not interested, you don't need to give that much radiation. So throughout the scan, uh, this is the, the generator, the X-ray tube is capable of generating different amount of photon or different MA. So this is an example of ECG gated retrospective scan mode, which we're going to talk a little bit more later, uh, controlled tube current modulation. For instance, in cyst diastole right here, we're interested in the coronaries. So we have higher tube standard tube current, so you get more signal noise ratio. In doing systole, which most of the time the coronary is moving, so we're not interested in the having a good image quality, high signal noise ratio. So it decreases the current that you can see is a little noisier to the extreme that sometimes we can lower the tube current to less than 25, 20, 30% of the standard, uh, which you believe it or not, you can still make out the cardiac structure, but obviously uh, you cannot do any, perform any coronary analysis. This is mainly is done for uh, chamber assessment. Second concept that we use all the time is KV or KVP. So 
instead of talking about amount of photon generating by the X-ray tube, this is referred to the maximum voltage applied across the X-ray tube or the speed the electron travel. So higher the speed, higher the kinetic energy. So it's a voltage across the X-ray. So this is different from what we call KEV or kilo electron volt spectrum. So the so KV is a voltage that X-ray tube applies. It's the maximum energy. So we say 100 KV, for instance, uh, that's the maximum energy. So, however, it generates uh, uh, a spectrum of wavelength band X-ray energy. Most of the time, about half to half of the peak voltage. So this is an example of regular CT exam applying 100 kV. Uh, you can see that um, the, 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 the spectrum, the maximum spectrum you achieve is about 80, 70, or 80. And uh, when you use fluoroscopy, for instance, 60 kV uh, is a little bit lower. Okay. So, so the energy that you have impart to the photon will affect the ability of X-ray beam to penetrate or going through or become attenuated by the tissue. So lower KV, less penetrating, there's gonna be more difference between the different part of the subject. There's more contrast, so it's, so it's, so it's, there's more so, so there's more contrast, it's a little bit busier, I should say. Higher KV is more penetrating, so you cannot make out the difference between the attenuation. So there's less contrast, okay? And this is a clinical example. This is the same patient performed in two different time with 120 KV and 90 KV. So what happened is with the lower tube voltage, you can see the contrast of iodine better because the KH of iodine is about 33 keV. So lower, closer to the 33 to 40 keV, you're gonna see more iodine signal, okay? So you get more, co more contrast Iodine or contra iodine contra iodinated contrast to noise ratio right here, then the study with higher tube voltage, which is not as bright, I would say. Okay. And you also get more noise because uh, you have a lot of tissue that you can depict it and it's hard to see the difference. So you gain better iodine detection, but you lose the edge. Uh, definition. Okay, so when do you apply different KV depending on the primary objective of your scan? And size matter, obviously, is everything. This again is a trans X ray, is a transmission CT is a base and transmission scan. So we have more tissue, obviously, more attenuation in order to produce. Uh, Diagnostic images, you need higher MA and KO and or KV. There's no way around it. Uh, larger patient, you just need to give them more radiation. The rule of thumb is the noise level double for every a, a centimeter increase in patient diameter exponentially. So, um, so newer scanner is capable of generating up to 140 KV. So what's the implication on this concept of MA and KV that we choose and radiation? So two current changes uh, result in the linear changes of the radiation exposure. So 20% of two current increase from 100 to 100 MA would increase exposure and radiation dose by 20%. On the other hand, two, two I'm sorry, two, Output of voltage change generation exposure is not linear. 
So a 20% increase in the tube voltage, 100 to 120 kV, would increase the patient exposure and radiation dose by up to 40 to 44%. If you think about the scanner we have, we can use 70 kV to 140 kV. So essentially, if we scan somebody for 70 kV, and you will get a radiation dose about four times higher if you use 140 kV. Okay, the scanning techniques. Number one rule of most of the cardiac imaging that is ECG gating is to overcome the cardiac motion. So the data from single phase the cardiac cycle is combined and stitched, stitched together. The motion is frozen and uh, essentially we're seeing what the heart looked like in that phase of a cardiac cycle. Okay. This is an example of non-gated study. So essentially when the x-ray goes through the tissue, uh, it randomly could flow into different part of the cardiac cycle. As you can see here, when you uh, put them together, uh, it's not uniform. And so gated, make sure that each part of the structure you're looking at is imaged exactly the same moment of phase of the cardiac cycle. So this is a case of patient with uh, uh, dissection, and this is a case of pseudo dissection due to the artifact caused by non gated Okay. Second concept is helical or sequential scan. This also you can hear as retrospective gating or prospective gating, spiral or axial or continuous or step, step and shoot. So in our lab, we use most of the time prospective and retrospective. So the helical CT scan principle is table is moving continuously during acquisition. So that's a key concept. So the continuous data acquisition and table feed, okay? So X-ray is on all the time and you're acquiring image the whole time when table is moving. Okay, this introduced the concept of pitch. So it's a ratio of the table translation um, to the X-ray beams and the Z direction. So table feet divided by rotation slide width. Um, so essentially pitch of one is the table is moving the same speed as the width of the detector. Um, so if you have pitch of two, meaning that it's moving fast, moving fast, you can, you can acquire a larger amount of coverage, meaning more, um, more extent of the, the body in less time. And because there could be, because it's faster, you also is giving less radiation. So lower the pitch, higher the radiation exposure, higher the pitch, lower the, the radiation exposure. On the other hand, prospective gating, step and shoot, is the table is stationary during acquisition of the data. Only moves in between different part of the body that you cover. So essentially for the cardiac imaging, if you start from the top in a 64 star CT, when the, so when we start, the table is not moving. You finish acquire the images, and then the table moves to the next part, usually about one to two cardiac cycle later, and so on and so forth. So essentially, most of the heart, you require three to four stop. So the table doesn't move during acquisition, only moves in between uh, different part of the, the body when, when the body is imaged. So this is a schematic representation retrospective ECG gating with, with uh, MA modulation. You can see the 
acquisitional data is throughout every single heartbeat. And the other hand, prospective ECG gating, you only acquire images most of the time e during every other beat. Okay. To make the concept a little more uh, a little more complex, uh, second generation dual source CT. So this is the conventional spiral CT because if only one detector, you require low pitch and slow scan rate. But when you have two, two detector, it allows you to do what we call flash spiral, high, high pitch, high scan B, okay? With the first one, you can see basically you, you certain part of the body is scanned more than once because the table is moving very slowly. So it's the redundant of data and you get high dose. This one, there's no redundant of data, so low dose. On the other hand, you have advantage of more data in case that you have a PVC or PAC, you can still retrieve some of the data. Um, so it's a trade-off depending on the rhythm of the patient. So, so flash of turbos, flash mode is a helical scan, okay? So it's not a perspective scan. So it's a high pitch spiral scan, usually a pitch of 3.2 that kind of acquired the whole heart in one and one RR interval, um, usually in the patient with less than 370 uh, heart rate, essentially you can acquire the image during a diastole only. So this is a schematic representation. And that's only possible, you have two sources. So the implication is the helical scan with pitch less than one, you're gonna give a lot of radiation, okay? It's gonna be much higher than the prospective gating because prospective gating, there's no, no redundance of data. The part of the body you want to image only was subjected to X-ray only once. Um, however, dual source helical scan with high pitch, you can get a radiation lower than a prospective gating. So the concept of spatial resolution. So spatial resolution is the narrowest distance between the two objects could be discriminated. CT is a three-dimensional technology. So we have what we call in-plane XY axis resolution, which is depends on the geographic characteristics of the scanner, usually 0.4 to 0.6 millimeter. The through-plane or Z axis or cranial color, I uh, want to say, it depends on the current meter width or, uh, or detect, detect, detector width. And that's usually between 0.5 to 0.625 millimeter. Uh, bear in mind, the invasive angiogram is uh, capable of producing the spatial resolution of 0.1 millimeter. So the result, I mean, currently CT um, compared to QCA uh, could probably only distinguish within 30% accuracy of the true narrowing compared to 10% with invasive angiograms. So this is a very important limitation. And the implication that we usually don't report 65% uh, stenosis, we report mostly a range. So what determines the spatial resolution? It's determined by the collimation and slice width. Essentially, the thinner the detector width, better the spatial resolution. So how come you say, well, let's make the detector was much thinner, but the problem is the thinner the slices, you have every, every detector is gonna only capture a small amount of uh, a signal. So you're gonna be very noise, very noisy. So we have to actually overcome by giving patient more radiation doses. So when people ask, okay, I, I have a, 256 slice CT compared to 64 slice CT is less radiation. Well, strictly speaking, to produce similar image quality, 256 slice CT, you would need to give 
more radiation. So that's important to, to understand. Obviously, we, we can do other things to decrease the radiation. The thinner the slices, more radiation you need to give to produce uh, less noisy images. Okay? So when you have thin slices, like right here, compared to here, you have more noise, you have less contrast, but you get better edge resolution, less contrast, resolution, and obviously less partial volume effect. The thick slices, you have less noisy, uh, more, um, more contrast, but you have you know, poor edge definition. So again, it depends on what type of polyvascular structure you want to look at. You can decide to use thin slices or thick slices. Next, a very important concept of temporal resolution is the ability of each technology to resolve the fast moving object or the shutter speed of the camera in order to freeze the motion, okay? When the cardiac motion, you can see the coronary moves throughout the cardiac cycle, especially the crux of the RCA. And if the temporal resolution is not fast enough, freeze the motion, you get this, what we call motion artifact, as you can see right here, I'm sorry. Okay, so people have gone through extended lanes to look at the image quality or rating acquire a different heart rate because the slower the heart rate, most likely doing diastole, the heart will be quiet doing diastasis, but hopefully the heart is not moving. As you can see here, the best image quality if a slow heart rate, a 55 is found during diastole, okay? However, when the heart rate is fast, you can see the best image quality is found during end of systole. Having said that, just remember, if you have someone with slow heart rate, it's always, you have a better chance to get an excellent image quality during diastasis or around 70%, 65 to 75% of the cardiac cycle. So what determines temporal resolution? It, it, it depends on how fast this gantry can spin. Uh, and the gantry rotation time divided by two is the temporal resolution because uh, the scanner uh, being a doesn't have to rotate 360 degrees to produce images with 180 degree, you can generate enough data to generate images. So again, temporal resolution depends on the gantry rotation. This we already talked about. Um, so basically the heart rate, the systole is less affected by the heart rate or the diastole obviously is more affected, it decreases with tachycardia. So that's why we still give beta blocker despite, we have, despite having uh, uh, a good temporal resolution um, dual source CT. So again, this is a case of patient uh, uh, image doing diastole with heart rate, high heart rate, uh, doing diastole is a lot of motion and doing systole image quality improves significantly. So most of the genera first generation 64 slide CT is about 350, 400 milliseconds. The newest scanner is at 280 to 250. And this is our scanner at work every time we acquire the images in our tour source CT. And this is obviously limited by centrifugal force. And there's a reason why we cover this. So the patient won't freak out. So going back to what's the temporal resolution of each scanner um, without flash scanner, actually the gantry rotation time is uh, 220 millisecond right now. So this is the older generation. So 200, half the rotation of 220 will be 110. 
and you further improve by factor of two because we have to two detectors for each detector will rotate 90 degrees. So therefore our scanner uh, has a temporal resolution about 55 millisecond, which unfortunately is still uh, worse than what MRI or echo can achieve. The other feature of this uh, dual source CT is what we call, uh, again, we mentioned about the uh, high pitch or flash mode. Okay, so this is the standard helical scanner. The table moves slowly and uh, with the high pitch mode, the table can move 80 second, 87 centimeter per second. That means we are able to image the patient, uh, average high patient, let's say uh, six feet, well, we'll try it only about a little bit over two seconds to scan from the top of the head to the to the toe. So we'll do CTA for him. Yes. So this is a schematic representation of dorsal height pitch. So scan time is only 250 to 270 milliseconds. And that allows you to uh, what we call free breathing in patients who are not cooperative. Uh, if you want a image part of the cardiac, part of the uh, body who doesn't move too much is perfectly suitable. So it's, it's great for trauma patient. And even we try to scan some patient who uh, who can breathe if the heart rate is, is slow and we can even achieve diagnostic images um, if they are not breathing very fast, of course. But um, so patient who cannot collaborate unless they're very tachymnic uh, using this high pitch helical CT mode, flash mode, we can obtain uh, diagnostic images. So, other type of uh, scanner is called is single source white coverage detector scanner. So 64 slices CT is a work. <laughs> now we have 256 to 320 detector CT. So essentially, uh, it's, as you can see, it's a huge uh, detector uh, set. And, um, but, it allows you to scan the whole heart in one single rotation. So it's a one beat. And obviously if you submit, if you scan the heart in a short period of time, you're gonna give very little radiation. So most of the time, if the heart rate is well controlled, you require one, one single rotation, one beat, and you can decide uh, how much of the correct cycle you want the image. So this will be an example of a 64 slice CT with four centimeter detector or coverage to image the heart. And this will be in the right 320 row CT with 16 centimeter detector. So every single part of the heart is imaged exactly at the same time where the one in the left with 64 slice CT, the top part is image a little bit earlier than the bottom of the. So this is a kind of example of we see a UFO flying through the medical center. On the right, this will be the, when you see the UFO, if you take a picture with the whole uh, white detector CT, you know, so th this will be between Methodist and, and St. Luke's Tower. But if you take, you need, if you use a four centimeter uh, detector 64 slice CT, you need to take four sets of picture. By the time you get to the other end, I'm sorry, the south end of the medical center, the UFO already has moved. So this had some implication in terms of the image quality and also for perfusion. 
Okay, so this will get a question all the time. Okay, how many how many slices, how many detectors your CT? And most of people think bigger is better, and uh, but that's let's clarify this. So, so number of detectors is not the same as number of slices. So number of detector is is physical, actually meaning how many rows of detectors you have. The slices of images to be manipulated through what we call Z flying focal spot technique. So you have periodic motion of focal spots can be manipulated electronically and move within this longitudinal direction back and forth. So you can double the number of slices essentially. So you can for 64 slices with 64 detector CT, you have 64 rows of detector, you can generate 128 slices, okay? So the number of detector rows and long axis and number of slices are not the same. Flying Z axis coverage can allow each detector to be sampled twice, so number of image is double and number of detectors with the same volume coverage, okay? Uh, it's important to specify the number of detector rows, which is more important than slices, because that allows you to see how much coverage each R is. Again, one more example of 64 detectors, 64 slices, uh, you get step artifact because again, as I mentioned, the top part of the heart is image earlier than the bottom. So you get heterogeneous or not homogeneous contrast compared to 256 slice of the tetra CT, I should say, uniform, there's no step artifact. So if you see a study, which we see, for instance, the study from Willowbrook, which are white detector system, you will never see almost never see step artifact, okay? On the other hand, our dual detector CT is not a white detector CT, so we can still get step artifact with the dual source scanner, okay? So again, we can, we already talked about this. So what are the implication of different scanner? We have dual source CT like we have here in the medical center, we have coverage of six centimeter, okay? So what it means is that each detector, we have two detectors. Each detector has six, uh, 96 rows of detector. We're using the, the technique that I mentioned earlier is able to generate 192 slices for each detector, okay? We have two detectors. Technically, we can say, okay, we're generating 384, but that's not how it works. And it doesn't make it better. So bottom line is for um, coverage, well, coverage of six centimeter, we require two to four rotation when we do prospective gating mode to obtain the images. So we still subjected the risk of step artifact. But we do have better temporal resolution, about 55 to 60 millisecond, and can perform both prospective or helical mode, and can do helical flash mode and 270, 250 millisecond acquisition. For white detector CT, such as the one we have in Willowbrook, is one, one source has a coverage of 16 centimeter and is able to perform single Harvey images most of the time unless the heart rate is very fast. And the temporal resolution you can imagine is a massive uh, 256 roller detectors. And in case of a Canon or a former Toshiba, there are 320 rows of detector. So we can imagine uh, there's no way you can spin that thing too fast 
So the temporal resolution is about 110 to 125 milliseconds. Again, mostly use prospective gating mode because there's no need to do a helical mode because the entire heart is within a single rotation. So the consequence is all this compared to the regular 64 slide CT, both type of technology leads to shorter imaging time. That means less radiation and less contrast needed. Next, we're gonna talk about a little bit what exactly we're measuring. So uh, uh, we showed earlier, x-ray tube generate, both generate uh, x-ray uh, going through the tissue attenuation and the pick up at the detectors. So the linear attenuation coefficient between the tube and detector, that's why we, that's why we, that's why we measure. And the coefficient reflect the degree in which x-ray intensity is reduced and it depends on what type of materials they encounter. So when you have raw data uh, measured by X-ray iteration, Kohlhausville unit in honor of the inventor of the CT. So putting the gray scales and, and after the acquisition, we generate attenuation profile and through mathematical manipulation, we have image reconstruction. Okay, so for the lower density of the matter, lower the Huntsville unit. So it range from minus 1,000 to 3,000 most of the time, and denser the tissue, higher the Huntsville unit, air is less than 1,000, water, Zero fat, usually less than, less than 40, minus 40. The blood, without contrast, 40 to 60. The vessel wall is a little bit higher. Uh, the IV contrast, we try to get between one, about 300. And the calcium, obviously, is much higher, usually over 600. So as you can see, in just any actual image scan, we can see different tissue. We know this is air, not because we only know this lung here, but because the attenuation density is very low, minus 850. Um, then you have this uh, very high density, which is the cable of the EKG, which is made of metal, is very high, 2,900. This is air in the environment, it's about minus 1,000, as I mentioned. The blood, I'm sorry, so this is the fat. Uh, intrathoracic fat is less than 100. This is myocardium with some contrast in there is about 100. Um, and uh, this is uh, soft tissue, about 45, and different part of the, um, so this is sternum, it's about 900, which is the calcium. So, that's allow us to therefore look at the luminous stenosis and the plaque composition. You have calcif you know, high density and lower density. So we know this is uh, calcification and this is probably a lipid rich uh, plaque. And the example could be based in assessment of pericardium. I mean, you could see here, so this is a patient with pericardial, epicardial fat infiltration very low density. This is a patient with uh, pericardial effusion near zero. This is a patient with uh, non-calcific pericardial thickening with sign of symptom of constrictive pericarditis. It's about tissue density. And this is a patient with calcification of the pericardium. And same thing we can look see in the in, in left ventricle, for instance, patient with remote history of myocardial infarction, you can see heterotropic calcification and fatty infiltration. And this is a patient with a clot, the patient with VSD, and the patient with pseudoaneurysm. So what's the implication? So CT is capable of tissue characterization. characterization. It's very specific about air, water, fat, and calcium. 
It's not so good for soft tissue. With the van, the photon counting CT, I think the things could get a little bit better, but I don't think we reached the, um, uh, what MRI can do. Contrast is very important. I mean, we look at the cardiac CT essentially because we want to get see the contrast deliver at the maximum intensity to the structure we're interested. So we use a power injector, three to ACC second injection to a phase with contrast followed by saline chaser. So when do we decide when do, there's two way of decide how to inject your contrast. Bonus tracking, essentially what you do is put a region of interest in, for instance, in the aorta, and you start injecting contrast. When a predefined threshold, usually about 100, 150 counselors in its reach, CT is triggered automatically, okay? So this is a, a monitor scan is obtained, and you can see when the contrast Council unit reach about 100, 100, 150, the scanner trigger. So for instance, for pulmonary artery, time of injection is about six to 13. Uh, for early systemic, systemic arterial phase, about 15 to 20. Um, for venous phase, about 180, about three minutes. Obviously, for cardiac veins, it'll be uh, less. And this produced pretty good result, but as you could imagine, the problem is if you have a patient with very bad EF, with severe tricuspid regurgitation, uh, the contrast might not ever reach uh, 100 hours per unit and the scanner might not trigger, or if the patient breathes, for instance, uh, and the and the regional interest move to the uh, PA, uh, you can trigger too early. You will miss out the coronary. Other one is bolus timing. Essentially, we're testing how the circulation time is. So we give a small amount of contrast, about 20, 15, 20% 20 of main bolus, and we track part of the structure we're interested in when you reach the peak and we try to uh, program our injection and delay time to the result of this uh, time intensity curve, okay? So just example of scan too early. Most of the contrast is just getting into the right heart. This is too late. Um, essentially, you see some venous return already, systemic venous return, and this is just right. Okay, so for different part of the cardiac structure, timing is different for left side of structure, for right side of structure. Last, I'm going to mention or clarify, try to clarify the concept. Uh, 40 CT gated dynamic, we get that all the time. So let's try to clarify this concept of terminology. 40 CT is obviously four dimensional CT, we get that all the time. Essentially, it's a display of three dimensional CT data set in motion. The so fourth dimension is time. You can image, you can either refer the time to the part of the cardiac cycle okay, systole or diastole, or you can refer that through the arterial venous phases, okay? So this 4D CT could be either referring to the cardiac cycle or the circulation arterial venous phases. So for cardiac CT, we inject the contrast to enhance the vascular compartment and then acquire a very specific time when the most of the contrast passing through our region of interest. According to CTA, we want the time to the point that most of the contrast is in the coronary artery. So it's actually rather a static image. So that's part of that moment of the time, what the contrast looks like. And what only thing that we're seeing is this contrast 
in the coronary artery look like different between systole and diastole. Okay, so it doesn't tell you the time, actually. Oh, we can do static myocardial perfusion and for car so basically we will image a little bit later when the uh, when the contrast mostly into the capillary because our our region of interest is myocardium. But if you want a cardiac vein for the CEP application, you need to wait a little bit to the time to the moment when uh, the, the the contrast reach the vein. So. If you look at this, if I want to see how the contract going through artery, capillary, and vein, this is no longer sufficient using a just regular cardiac uh, CT, daily cardiac CTA. Okay, so this is just an example, for instance, uh, of a gated CT, three dimensional CT of patient with myocardial bridge. You can see doing systole and diastole. This milking effect. Okay, so, so we're not we're only seeing the arterial phase. Okay, but we can see doing systole diastole. So it's okay to call it 4D CT. But uh, the same here, uh, the patient with uh, uh, TMVR. So although the movie is moving, this is a 4D CT. I would not call it dynamic CT. Same as here, and this patient with dissection. Uh, so this is also a 4D CT, but not a dynamic CT in a, in a, in a correct sense. So dynamic CT, actually, we want to be able to see how the contrast traverse from the arteries, the capillary to the vein, and uh, uh, sequential, sequ with, after an injection, we do sequential scan at different level of interest. We can see the time alternation, construct time alternation curve. You can do it gated or non-gated. If you want to do myocardial perfusion, you want to be gated. If you want to do peripheral vascular uh, organ perfusion, uh, you don't need to do gated, you can do non-gated. Okay, this is just an example of time resolved CTA. We see the contrast coming first coming in the RA, RB, LA more, and then gradually moves through the left-sided and eventually go to system systemic. Uh, and um, so this is, uh, could be done both with dual source CT or whole heart uh, perfusion imaging using a uh, white detector CT. Uh, so this will be a, a, a application for uh, myocardial perfusion. And other uh, finding that we use, find, is identification of endoleak. As you can see right here, uh, this uh, patient with uh, uh, EVAR as endoleak, we were able to identify uh, the location and also the feeding vessel and the exit vessel. And this is another example of cardiac application, a patient with with PDA, you can see how the injection of the contrast first goes through the RV, PA, and from PA, you can see the contrast going to the aorta directly before, before the left side of the structure uh, was enhanced. Okay. Another example here the patient with. Uh, possible uh, small uh, shunting, as you can see the pulmonary artery bypass directly, then goes through the, the capillary and goes through directly through this probably malformation and return to the venous side. Okay. okay. So this is the last example I'm gonna show you. It's a little bit trickier. So this is a gated CT, but you can actually see the blood flow leaking from the upper camera into a pseudo aneurysm. So this is technically uh, also, even if you can see the flow is not a, a dynamic CT. This is just a, a 4D CT, 4D gated CT. 
So uh, just to clarify this, if most of the time for cardiac application, we use uh, 4D CT, 4D AD CT, we should reserve dynamic or time reserve mode for organ perfusion or when you want to look at the, uh, the circulation or transient through the different part of the circulation. Okay, that's, I think we're right on time. One minute, one minute to spare to take any question. Any question? Any fellow, imaging fellow? I am. Again, throughout the year when we're reading, we, we will go through in more detail all these items that I mentioned because um, uh, it's a lot to learn uh, in CT, not only, again, uh, uh, the, technique, the technical component, but patient preparation, uh, uh, how do we reconstruct the images, how we display it, how we analyze it, how we go around artifacts. Uh, each topic, you know, we need uh, a lecture for that. Okay, last chance for ask any question. Okay, I saw some chat. Okay, all right. But, all right, if there's no question, thank you very much. See you next week. <laughs>